Hello friends, it's Sabrina Lewick here with another sciencey whiny wine production lecture. Today we are focusing on aromatic white wine production. So for those who are tuning in, this lecture is designed for students at the Institute for Enology and Viticulture at Walla Walla Community College. But if you are an MW student, uh, you're welcome to ride along. There's a lot of good info in here. So breaking down our white wine varieties, of course, a non-exhaustive list, into aromatic and non-aromatic varieties. So today we're going to be tackling Sauve Blanc, Gewurz, Riesling, Muscat, Tarantes, and Viognier. And really, we're mainly going to be focusing on Sauve Blanc and Riesling because home turf here is Washington, and uh, this is Sauve Blanc and Riesling country, especially Riesling country. So varieties that we're not going to discuss this week are Chardonnay, uh, different types of Pinot, so including Green Blanc, Chenin Blanc, or other Rhone Whites. We are going to talk about non-aromatic or full-bodied white wine production next week. So what makes an aromatic white wine? Mainly concentration of aromatic compounds, especially terpenes or specifically monoterpenes. So this fantastic chart here is relative concentrations of monoterpenes in different varietal wines. And this awesome research was done two years ago in 2018 and um, I will include a link at the end to read this paper. It's actually open source, um, or not open source, but it, it's not behind a paywall online and it totally kills. So looking at different varieties here, it might be actually easier for us to start at the right hand side here and see who's on the low end here. Chardonnay and Pinot Gris. Um, ramping things up, Viognier has about four times more, and Riesling has about four times more terpenes than Chardonnay or Pinot Gris, and then we're getting about six times more in Gewurz, and when we get to Muscat and Tarantes, it's close to 30 times more. Uh, so those are certainly aromatic varieties. And you might be saying, well, hey, Sabrina, you just talked a big game about Sauvignon Blanc on the other slide, and I don't see any Sauvignon Blanc on this slide. The reason for that is because Sauvignon Blanc is a highly aromatic variety that is not, uh, it doesn't have a core varietal structure derived from terpenes. Uh, its main varietal structure um, for aromatics is derived from volatile thiols, which are aromatic compounds that contain a sulfur. So um, that boxwood, that passion fruit, that guava, um, the green grassy aroma, um, all of those are thiols um, and not terpenes. So it doesn't make the list here. However, Sauvignon Blanc can be explosive with those kind of compounds. So here's a deep dive into the same data from that same paper that I was looking at on that previous slide here. And now we can see a little bit about the individual compounds that these researchers are looking at. So I'm gonna grab my little highlighter here and start just highlighting things. So our navy, or our, actually I should say our medium blue. So on Toronto's here, you see this guy right here? That is citrus orange. And take a look here. Uh, so just kind of relax your eyes, go across the page here. Chardonnay, like eh, nothing. Gewurztraminer, yeah, we've got some. Pinot Gris, eh. Riesling, eh. Sauvignon Blanc, eh. Viognier, a little bit there. Um, so one of the markers I get for Viognier when I'm blind tasting is like orange oil, citrus oil. So it's definitely present in Viognier. And our sort of sea green here is isomers of mural oxide. So this is sort of a green floral uh, aroma. And you can see that it's pretty cranked in a lot of different things here, actually. This is uh, present across the board in all of these varieties, um, which is interesting to see. Um, another important compound that I want to highlight here, let's see if I can find, oh, there it is. So lavender and black tea, which is linalool oxide. 
super present in Muscat and Tarantes. Um, and also a good amount in Riesling, but you can see it's really dwarfed by Muscat and Tarantes. Um, really interesting to see that this is in such high concentration and these really explosively floral varieties. And then another thing worth mentioning here is that this pine woody floral aroma is also really cranked in Muscat and Tarantes. So if you get Muscat and Tarantes mixed up, if you're blind tasting, uh, do not fear. You can see that they are very similar in signature according to their concentration of monoterpenes. And if you take away anything from this slide here, I suggest just relaxing your eyes and looking at the differences here. Focus on how minimal Chardonnay and Pinot Gris are and how extreme Muscat and Tarantes are and how we have some cool things kind of happening in the middle here with Gewurztraminer, Riesling, and Viognier. It's also interesting to see that um, that sort of pine, uh, or excuse me, that lavender black tea um, is quite present in Sauv Blanc as well. So I was saying that this variety is highly derived, or excuse me, that the varietal character of this wine is highly derived from thiols, that's true. However, it doesn't mean that it's free of terpenes. This one um, is definitely in the game, more so than Chardonnay and Pinot Gris. So transitioning now into the production of these varieties. So we have some pretty key considerations here. Um, what we're looking for is the retention and promotion of these aromatics as the character of these wines is so der derived from these aromatic qualities. Additionally, several of these varieties may have um, importance from sugar acid balance. So important um, pillars of the style are derived from the sweetness and we wanna make sure that we get that sugar acid balance correct. So examples of this would definitely be Riesling, um, and also I would throw a Gewurztraminer in there as well. Usually new oak is not in play here, um, with some exceptions, like for example, Viognier um, can see a little bit of new oak in both California and the Northern Rhone, but overall this is not an important part of the style, and contrast that with say Chardonnay, um, where um, Inclusion of new oak is usually related to the quality of the fruit, and it's a really important component of the overall flavor. And in that same kind of boat here, leaves are probably not in play here very heavily. Um, so for new world style of winemaking, which we're going to focus on because this presentation is for students at Wall Wall Community College, you're probably making a more sort of clean, technical, new world style of wine where leaves aren't going to be stirred up and say you're, you're Riesling here. But um, lees are increasingly important in the fuller body styles of wine that we're going to talk about next week. So a reminder of what's going on. Um, you can see that we have a deviation that happens at crushing here between our red and our white wines. And um, I actually take some issue with this uh, image here, this flow diagram of winemaking that comes from Ron Jackson and his winemaking text from 2008. Um, so they actually say, uh, well, I, okay, I don't take great issue, but it says red and rosé wines here on this side. I would actually say that rosés um, should be put over here um, because that light maceration period that you're getting uh, on rosés is usually happening, you know, for a very short period of time, just directly before pressing. So a reminder that a lot of our style for these wines is actually derived right here at pressing, a little bit at fermentation, and then a lot at finishing if we are dealing with residual sugar. So we've got a couple key points here. So we're gonna focus on some areas of the production process more than others because of that. So um, here is sort of a master sheet of considerations that we're dealing with in these aromatic varieties. So going through line by line. First off, we've got Sauvignon Blanc. This is a high acid variety 
with minimal phenolics. When we're finishing the wine, um, we are almost never going for any kind of sweet profile. So residual sugar, there may be a teeny, 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 tiny bit, but usually no, the style goal is dry. So if there is sugar present, it's to shave off a little bit of the profile of the acid that's present, or maybe a little bit of the tannin as well. So our production considerations here, we're looking to gain exciting flavors from the skin. Um, so a lot of those fresh tropical files are in the skins, but we also want to avoid tannin at the same time. So we're going to have to balance that skin contact with other processing aids that help us remove that tannin. For Gewurz here, this is actually quite a low acid variety, sort of, sort of medium, and the phenolic is quite high. If you actually take a look at Gewurz or berries, they can be pretty russet colored. So it's really common to have residual sugar in this style of wine. The main considerations that we're thinking about here are management of pH. Gewurz naturally has bonkers high pH, even in cool climates, which can lead to a very soft mouthfeel. So you're managing that pH just for wine safety purposes. And then also you're thinking a little bit about how you're going to balance residual sugar in a wine that doesn't have a lot of acid structure, because it's pretty easy to balance sugar in a wine that's high acid, but not so much when the wine has low acid. So to contrast that, looking at Riesling here, this has screaming high acid and low phenolics. And residual sugar here, it, sugar, excuse me, is common because we have that really high level of acidity. So even in a wine that appears dry, there may be a kiss of residual sugar, like something like three grams a liter isn't really going to show up as sweet, but in a high acid wine, it's going to maybe shave off a little bit of the rough edges or the harsh edges that come from having screaming high acid. And this is kind of a dream variety at times, you know, low pH means low microbial issues. Um, high acid means a lot of fun that you can have when you're playing around with residual sugar levels to balance things out. So um, this can be pretty fun to work with. And additionally, um, we're not dealing with a lot of concerns about aromatic degradation. And we're going to talk a little bit about things that oxidize during um, the processing of grapes. But Riesling doesn't have a lot of stuff that oxidizes away. So it can get battered around a teeny bit, which is nice, um, in contrast to Sauve Blanc, where it's really quite delicate. Moving into Muscat here, which is kind of a wild card. So the acid can be a little bit sloppy on Muscat. One of the positive qualities of Muscat is that you can get flavor ripeness and acid ripeness at very low sugar levels. So what I mean by that is that the wine has beautiful varietal correctness at 18 or 17 degrees bricks with acid that doesn't absolutely rip your face off where it would in all of these other varieties. So that means that we can harvest Muscat at relatively low bricks and produce really nice low alcohol styles of wine even when the wine is dry. So this is a low acid variety um, it does have a lot of phenolic to it. Um, the good news is that we're often balancing that phenolic with some sort of residual sugar. There's not a lot of dry muscats out there. So if you're dealing with a highly phenolic grape, you don't think, have to think about processing this a lot um, to remove that phenolic, adding a lot of fining agents during the juice clarification, say, because that residual sugar that we've got here is going to smooth out that tannin but we do have some issues here. So for example, management of pH, it can be pretty stressful to make a white wine at pH like three, seven, which you can see in muscats. And also um, there's kind of fun, but also the challenge of balancing those um, phenolics with some level of residual sugar. So pro and con there. And um, I am definitely not a Toronto's expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, because Torontes is a variety that's nearly unique to Argentina, but I've put it on this list anyway because it was really fun to see on those slides with how many terpenes it has. And Torontes is um, a hybrid of Muscat of Alexandria and Criolla Chica, 
which is one of the uh, grapes that was brought over by the conquistadors into Argentina. So this has 50% parentage in Muscat, and it shares a lot of qualities, as you saw on that slide there, with those terpenes. So same deal, you know, low acid, high phenolic, but the difference here is that Tarantes is usually made into a dry style of wine without residual sugar. So the main consideration, in my opinion here, not based on um, experience with Tarantes, is that you would be dealing with management of pH and trying to retain the freshness of acidity in this variety. Um, but again, I, I admit fully that I haven't worked with Tarantes because I am not in Argentina. <laughs> However, I have worked with Viognier for about 10 years. So the acid here can be pretty sloppy as well, pretty much to Gewurztraminer levels, and the phenolic can be very high here. So Viognier is a thick skin, pulpy variety that's really hard to press. So yield management can really be an issue here. Um, and if you're trying to get yield out of Viognier, one of the ways to do it is you're, you're destemming it, you're putting it in the press, and you're doing a lot of dump and tumble. You know, press cycle, squeeze, bag deflates, roll the bladder, or roll the, roll the press, squeeze, unsqueeze, roll the press and repeat for an hour and a half. And what we're doing here is we're getting yield, but we're also extracting a lot out of those skins and there's a lot of phenolics to be extracted there. So um, the key consideration here is management of those phenolics at the press. So if you're working with Viognier, it's my opinion that you sort of have to either go for yield and then be able to clean up the juice on the back end, basically through some sort of flotation process that pulls phenolics out, or you have a really gentle press cycle that involves whole cluster pressing, but you don't get a lot of yield out of your fruit. So both of these techniques can work, um, but both of them are there to manage those really serious phenolics that we're getting out of Viognier. And here's a lovely image of our man, Joel, dumping a bunch of Marsan um, that you harvested last year in 2019 into macro bins. Please shut your eyes and imagine that it is Sauvignon Blanc, <laughs> another aromatic white variety. So when we're harvesting fruit, the fruit is removed from the vines when either the winemaker or viticulturist deems it appropriate. And we can do this either by hand or machine. Um, it's important to note that modern machine harvesters are very good. So previously, um, tech from, you know, the 90s or 80s, those machine harvesters really beat the vines around quite a bit. The whole principle of machine harvesting is vibrational bows that rattle the vines and force the fruit to fall off the vine. And this can be a kind of a traumatic process. But the process now is a lot more gentle and we're getting these beautiful intact whole berries that are coming off of the vines in a way that they did not on those previous mechanical harvesters. So if you hold um, the idea of hand harvesting being the absolute pinnacle of quality in your mind, I encourage you to broaden your thoughts and consider um, a high quality machine harvesting as a really great alternative. The one thing that I say in a caveat to that is that when you do a machine harvest, you have no stems present. So we're not dealing with whole clusters anymore. We're dealing with these little individual berries and they may be slightly broken up from that process. So what you have is berries in contact with juice in a container in transport to the winery. So what you're gonna get there is a little bit of skin soak. And this is for good or for ill because skin soak means flavor extraction, but skin soak also means phenolic extraction. So both of these things can be managed um, a little bit later in the winery. So um, key idea here, I know this sounds silly, if you are machine harvesting, you cannot whole cluster press. So um, I've actually worked with the Washington Wine Technical Group on um, some harvest trials and uh, contacting different winery facilities and asking them if they have the ability to do different things. And some of the 
um, responses that we get back say, this is a cool trial, we can't do it because we can't whole cluster press. Because some of these larger facilities, um, they can only receive machine harvested fully distemmed fruit um, because they don't have distemmer technology at the winery. So something to consider here. If you are machine harvesting, you are not whole cluster pressing. Now moving into processing. So I've included some fun pictures here. So the first step here is the distem and crush process. And like I said in the previous slide, you don't distem if you're whole cluster pressing. It just goes right into the press as whole clusters. Um, if we're whole cluster pressing, you have less skin contact, which can be ideal for non-aromatic varieties, like for example, Chardonnay, where texture is really important. So smoothness that comes from lower skin contact can, can be really key. Also, um, we're generally dealing with lower yields if we are whole cluster pressing. And um, that's just because um, we don't have a lot of enzymes in play, for example, if we're doing whole cluster pressing in general. That doesn't mean you can't add whole or enzymes when you're whole cluster pressing, but it's easier to get more yield when you're not doing whole cluster. Um, one of the nice things about whole cluster actually is you can, those stems can kind of act like channels for juice to get out of the press. So when we are dealing with aromatic white varieties or varieties that we're fully distemming, we often throw rice hulls into the mix and that can act like a, um, a, a alternate form of juice channeling. So we don't just plug up the press um, grates with slippery skins. And after that, we can choose to macerate. So this goofy photo that we have right here, thanks to alumni Gary Weber for taking that right here. Um, this is actually um, muscat right there. So um, in that vintage, we had taken some muscat and we had just done a pretty extreme maceration on it. Um, so we were actually doing a skin contact muscat and um, we were fermenting it on skins. And then what we did was we distilled it afterwards for a high, highly aromatic distilled spirit. Um, this may not be um, ideal for almost all varieties because skin contact makes an orange wine, which may not be your style goal. Um, and it may be too much phenolic as well. Usually we sort of step or um, pass over this maceration process and go crush and distem into the press right here. And on our crush pad, there's a literal line that goes from the distem and crush process right into the press. And you can see that line right there. So that's an axial feed valve that goes right into the press. And you can choose to do oxidative or reductive styles of pressing here. So I'm gonna highlight again, maybe with a smaller pen here. So this is stainless steel, basically cylinder on its side, and our press plates are at the bottom right there. And the juice is coming out. So there's only three great channels for that juice to come out of there. So there's not a lot of air contact. But in some styles of presses, there might just be a lattice here of stainless steel, and the juice is just pouring out from all sides. And that would be an oxidative press because we're getting a lot of air contact on that juice. And oxidative or reductive is an important style choice, which is really a key to driving style, especially when we're dealing with varieties like Sauvignon Blanc with thiols that are very easily oxidized. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then after that press process, we're gonna be settling and clarifying our juices. So there's a question of how clarified do we need to be? That is really winemaker and style dependent, especially some people who are producing fuller body styles of wines, like say Chardonnay, they might, uh, and especially in a boutique style, they may choose to do a little bit lower clarification. Um, some producers may choose to go a lot higher if they're looking for super clean, um, just really linear ferments with no funny business. So um, it's style dependent here. Um, mainly for aromatic whites, we are looking at pretty highly clarified juices. And at this stage, we are going to need to pull a juice panel because this is the best stage to get juice information. Um, because that's actually the material that you're working with in your ferment.
Now moving on to additives. So these are things that we would be adding during processing or settling or pressing. Sulfur dioxide, my favorite thing. So the functions here are antimicrobial and antioxidant. Um, so we're inhibiting microbes and we're lowering the effects of oxygen on the wine where it could oxidize delicate precursors for aromatic compounds. Additionally, the main thing here is that it inhibits polyphenol oxidase, which is a juice browning enzyme. And because it's uh, attacking, well, not attacking, but inhibiting microbes, I should say, um, it enhances the settling of juices because active live microbes are less inclined to settle. So the main way that we add this is with potassium metabisulfite. So you might recognize this bag here. We like to buy our SO2 in little one kilogram bags because we're a boutique winery and we tend to do doses of SO2 in relatively small amounts. Like a single barrel, for example, post ferment gets about 25 to 27 grams into 225 liter barrique. So these are relatively small amounts and uh, sulfur dioxide degrades very quickly. So we want to have these really fresh packages. Um, if you're in a larger winery, you might buy sulfur dioxide in large containers because you're really cranking through it. But if you're in boutique production, the freshness of these small bags is really important. So potassium metabisulfite is a salt of SO2. It, it contains potassium as well. And then what we do here during crush is we dissolve it in cold water and we sprinkle it in during the production process. We're not sprinkling it in as a dry compound because we're trying to disperse it as well as possible. So cold water is key here. Another thing that we can add is enzymes. And here at the college, we're pretty bullish on enzymes because they really do make our lives a lot easier because we are settling juices and um, therefore we really just want to make it easier and get some clarified juice that settles a lot easier. So enzymes at this stage are all different pectolytic enzyme preparations. So that means that their core function is to break down pectin. And basically that means cutting into the pectin in the grape cell walls and that makes the cells easier to press so we're getting like more liquid out of the grape berries and in a red wine context, and we'll talk about that in a few weeks, that means getting also more color and tannin extraction out of the fruit. So some examples here that we use at the college, um, we really love Color Pro and Sin Free. So um, Scott Zyme Sin Free here from Scott Laboratories um, is here to increase pressability. So basically it makes the fruit softer and easier to squish. It also increases in clarification because it's sort of like a reverse um, jam making process or um, uh, not jam, jelly would be a better example. So basically what we're doing here is we're adding something that decreases the viscosity of the juice so that instead of making like a firm jelly, we're making a super soft light liquid so that all the heavy stuff falls through the liquid to the bottom. And additionally, this enzyme can also increase aroma because it can start to cleave off some interesting aromatic compounds before we start the fermentation process. Another thing that we're a big fan of is Scott's Zyme Color Pro, also a Scott Labs product. And this aids in clarification and settling in whites, but it's also um, a good enzyme for reds as implied in the, the name where it's softening up the grape berries so that you get more tannin and color extraction out of reds. So what is the difference between oxidative and reductive processing? For oxidative processing, we're looking to increase the dissolved oxygen content in the juice. And what happens when we do that is mainly two things. One is that it promotes tannin polymerization. So if we've got some phenolics in the juice that we don't like, they're gonna get browned out and they'll bind together and it'll help smooth out the tannin texture of that juice. And additionally, some dissolved oxygen content can actually be really helpful um, for yeast kinetics. And I'll show you that on the trial that we did on Riesling this year. For reductive processing, we're looking to minimize oxygen content to retain freshness of certain aromatics. So 
this doesn't apply to all aromatics. Um, this is mainly for thiols, um, which are sulfur containing compounds. Um, and we found that processing under um, inert gas like uh, carbon dioxide can help us retain those aromatics. So for oxidative processing, um, you could choose to add no additions or maybe uh, an enzyme that helps extraction or clarification but you're not looking to actively add antioxidants, whereas with reductive processing, you're adding antioxidants that can include sulfur dioxide, ascorbic acid, or CO2 snow um, to help blanket the juice. There are certain varieties that benefit from um, reductive processing. Um, as the main one is Sauvignon Blanc. Um, this technique was actually pioneered in New Zealand. And also um, quite a few varietal aromatic for Pinot Gris can be um, thiol derived, so it could also be helpful for that. Um, oxidative processing can be helpful on many different varieties, but especially ones that have higher phenolic contact, uh, content, like something like Viognier, for example. And equipment needed. So for oxidative, this works with any press, but if you're looking to maximize air contact, you're looking for a press that probably has more channels so that you can basically have more surface area for the juice to contact the air. Whereas with reductive processing, you're gonna need a membrane press that has pretty few juice channels. So if you think about the style of the press that we have here at the college, it looks like a stainless steel cylinder on its side and it's got three juice grates that go at the bottom. So when we're pressing, the juice is only coming out of a small area. So we're not getting a lot of air contact there. You're also gonna need a carbon dioxide tank with a snow cone, some way of generating solid CO2 that you can blanket into the press and in the press pan. So this big sheet here uh, tells you what we did on our different aromatic varieties in 2019. So starting with Sauvignon Blanc, we did reductive processing on this. So we were blanketing the hopper that the grapes were, uh, destemmed grapes were falling into. And um, we were also blanketing the fruit as it came down the chute. And we were adding sulfur dioxide at that hopper. And we were also adding some rice hulls at that hopper. Um, but the rice hulls aren't for reductive pressing. Um, they're not a, uh, a reductive aid. What they are doing though is helping our juice channel out of our press. So it increases our yield and prevents um, all the grapes from basically just sticking together in there and having no channels for the juice to escape. So the CO2 and the SO2 were um, for antioxidant purposes and those rice hulls were for pressability. On the Riesling, we did it semi-oxidative style. Um, so still in that membrane press, and we added a little bit of sulfur dioxide at the press pan, but we weren't blanketing the wine at all, or excuse me, the juice with any kind of CO2. And, or, and um, we also added a couple different enzymes. Um, sorry, I'm losing my place here on this giant chart. So what we added on Riesling was Scottzyme Sinfree, uh, which is one of our favorite enzymes to use uh, for juice clarification. So we added that in at the press pan. And um, when we go over the full details on the Riesling at the end, I'll talk about other products that were added at flotation. Um, the SO2 was a light antioxidant and the pectinase was for clarification. So there was an antioxidant added here, but we were doing it semi-oxidative style. So this wasn't full protection. Pretty similar deal with Viognier, semi-oxidative in the membrane press with some SO2 at the hopper. Um, but when we were doing the float on this, we added a lot of different things. So we added PVPP, polyvinyl polypyrrolidone, which binds up to small phenolics that come from white skin. Uh, we added casein as well, which helps bind up some of those astringent compounds from the skin. And we also added Scottzyme Sinfree, same as we did with the Riesling, and that just helps to clarify the juice. So the SO2 is a light antioxidant, and the PV and P uh, PVBP and the casein were uh, for phenolic management. And that pectinase was for clarification, just like it was on the Riesling. And finally, looking at the muscat here, this was a reductive process in the membrane press. And uh, so we actually, I forgot to put this on the sheet here, but we added carbon dioxide um, blanketing at the distemmer and hopper. We added SO2 at the hopper, and we added also Color Pro at the hopper. So that helps with our pressability. And um, 
Interestingly enough, we also added carbon here at flotation. So activated carbon um, is quite commonly used on juices that may have some level of rot. And our muscat often comes in with a little bit of a dash of that. So the carbon at flotation helps remove some of those moldy flavors if we had any present. Um, so the SO2 was a light antioxidant. Um, the pecosinase helped with our pressability and the carbon was just for rot flavor management. So now we're at the clarification stage. And clear juice results in a cleaner ferment up to a point. So what I mean by a cleaner ferment is less off flavor or an, and aroma production. However, we can also over clarify our juice and yeast can get stressed out at that point because yeast do like to sit on things when they ferment. And if the juice is too clear, it can actually stress them out as well. But almost all wine production does involve, um, white wine production, excuse me, involves the use of clarified juice. So if we're making a really clean, technical, aromatic white wine, um, uh, just a classic New World style, um, we probably want some pretty clear juice here. So what we're doing is we're getting rid of the solids that are generated during pressing. So insoluble stuff, so that means like bits of grape, um, little pieces of dirt that came in on the fruit. Um, it also means microbiology like yeast and bacteria as well. So um, the pectinase and cellulase enzymes that we could add at this stage or that we added during the press cycle are going to help us here because they're going to reduce the viscosity of that juice and all of this stuff, including the yeast and bacteria, is going to fall to the bottom if we're doing a natural settling. Um, but um, we can also do um, settling through a couple different manners. We could do um, flotation or centrifugation as well. If we're doing a traditional settle, which is pretty common in boutique wineries, smaller production facilities, we'd probably do a combination of pectinase and cellulase, so some sort of enzyme package, and also bentonite. So bent, that's the same bentonite that we use for heat stabilization later on, and it's actually kitty litter. And this aids in the lees compaction. And what ends up happening when we use bentonite is uh, when it swells in water, basically we open up these charge, charged plates. And these charged plates have a large amount of surface area, and they grab things as the bentonite falls to the bottom of the tank. So um, this indiscriminate grabbing process um, gets a lot of that yeast bacteria, the scraps of grapes, all of that business. And it also helps compact the lees so that it's easier to rack the clear juice off the top so that we can get a little bit more yield. Um, another technique for clarification, which is common at larger facilities, is flotation. And uh, at the college, we actually came up with our own little flotation device. Tim is brilliant that way. So he actually made a miniature flotation device that works on our small tank sizes. And uh, what he was doing was adding pectinase, gelatin, often PVPP, and colloidal silica, um, which is a counterfining for gelatin. And also we would bubble at the same time with nitrogen or oxygen, excuse me, not oxygen, with air. Um, but we were usually doing nitrogen. And uh, in that flotation, what was happening was all the junk, all the insoluble stuff was getting bubbled to the top of the tank and entrained in that gelatin cap. So the clear juice was actually below this garbagey cap of stuff as opposed to above it, which is what we would have if we were doing a, a traditional settling. And we were really happy with the results of the flotation. Um, it actually was a complete game changer in how we produce grown whites because of the phenolic issues that we've had with them historically, because gelatin and PVPP are fining agents for phenolics. At this stage, we also want to get chemical analysis on our juice because now we're actually dealing with the juice that we're going to be working with during the winemaking process. So uh, what we should get is Brix, PH, TA, and YAN at minimum. Um, YAN is really important because we want to know how much nitrogen we need to add. This is especially important in Washington because we have such low yans that we almost always need to supplement our fruit. So it's good to know our starting point there. 
And then I also highly recommend getting glucose and fructose, which is a better uh, indication of sugar content than bricks. Specific acids are really valuable as well, especially if you're undergoing malolactic fermentation. And it's nice to just for fun to know the yam species. So ETS will uh, tell this to you when you get your juice panels. They'll tell you how much is amino acids and how much is ammonia. And then also at this stage, it's nice to get potassium um, because if we're dealing with higher pH musts, we can um, predict some acid stability issues based on our potassium content here. Basically, high potassium means we're going to lose tartaric later. So here is our data from our juices on our 2019 Sauve Blanc. And just for funsies, we did uh, analysis on the free run and then also the juice post flotation. So the post flotation juice is the, the real starting point for the ferment. So that's the actual number that we estimate or we um, calculate our ads based on. So um, let's see if there's anything interesting to see here. Minor changes during the flotation process. Um, let me get my little highlighter here and circle a few things. Um, it's actually a good amount of potassium here. So an indication that we're gonna lose some tartaric later. Um, our yeast assimilable, assimilable nitrogen is pretty junky, unfortunately. So we can just supplement that with DAP. And to contrast that, here's our muscat, which has its own set of issues. So we're looking actually pretty good on these yams. We have to supplement it a little bit because clean ferment is really important for our muscat because it goes to bottle in a month and we really don't wanna be dealing with any off flavors. We basically have to have it come out of ferment pristinely clean so that it's ready to bottle in less than two weeks. But check it out here. That is a little bit of a sloppy pH. That is a value that I would more commonly see on a red than a white. And uh, let's see here. Moderate malic, low tartaric. So good news here. This is a non-malolactic variety. We're not putting this through malolactic fermentation at all. Um, so what we can do is supplement the acids um, to boost them up with a, a mix of uh, malic and tartaric if we wanted to. Um, and a little bit of DAP and we are good to go here. But this definitely involves some acid management. Whereas the Sauvignon Blanc definitely didn't need acid management. Those were good values. Moving into fermentation. So we have a couple different options here for fermenting our wines. The main one is the standard Saccharomyces cerevisiae or baker's yeast, um, but we also have Saccharomyces bianus. And this is um, basically a champagne yeast species that's more acid and ethanol tolerant. So EC1118 is a bianus and it's really great um, mainly for more high octane reds. Um, that's less of a concern when we're dealing with aromatic whites because we don't necessarily need a powerhouse here. Um, what we need is actually a yeast strain that really promotes aromatics. So speaking of promoting aromatics, um, there's some fun options that you can have with Torlospora delbrucii. So this is a Torlospora yeast, so it's not Saccharomyces, and um, it has low ethanol tolerance, but it's really great at liberating aromatics. So we've actually used it as a leading yeast on um, Sauve Blanc and also Pinot Gris, Rosé of Pinot Gris, I should say, um, way back in the day. And you have to follow it with a Saccharomyces of some kind because due to the low ethanol tolerance, this species won't finish the ferment, but it'll start it out really nice and it'll liberate a lot of aroma while it's doing that. Um, as a fun kind of side fact, it's also high um, with, in osmotic tolerance. So what that means is if you have a really high Brix must, that if you inoculated it with Saccharomyces, the Saccharomyces would stress out. Um, this is a really great tool. And the osmotic stress is when we have so much sugar present that the water is getting sucked out of our Saccharomyces yeast bodies and they're basically dying. They're producing off flavors like volatile acidity because they're dying. So we've actually used this on stupidly high sugar ice wine must to start the ferment because um, 
the fruit went into the freeze at about 35 bricks and it came out over 50. And that was pretty much impossible to ferment with Saccharomyces, but um, starting it with Troilospora actually, and then following a Saccharomyces after it had ticked down a few degrees bricks was really helpful. Um, so another person who uses Troilospora locally is uh, Fiona Mack over at Smack Wines. Um, she uses them on one of her um, rosés for aromatic liberation as well. So here's our Guy Lussac equation, and that's just the conversion of sugar into carbon dioxide and ethanol. When we are fermenting with Saccharomyces, about 55 to 65% of the sugar is fermented into ethanol. And uh, so that's where we get our potential alcohol estimation of bricks times 0.6. This number is variable, so if you are working at a facility for an extended period of time, I recommend um, analyzing your ferment information and figuring out what your conversion rate actually is for your yeast or your individual vineyard blocks, because it can vary. And then 35 to 40% of that sugar goes into carbon dioxide, which is bubbled out of the ferment. 1% goes into biomass, so that's the yeast cell bodies. And then 4% goes into other, which is actually the exciting flavor and aroma compounds. So that's where uh, we're making our money there. When we're in ferment, we really don't need chemical analysis unless something is really going wrong. Um, so what we just do um, is measure bricks and temperature daily. And you can do this with a hydrometer or a densitometer. Um, when we talk a little bit about our higher octane reds like Cabernets and Syrahs, we'll discuss a little bit about the value of mid-ferment sugar and ethanol analysis. And here's a fun slide showing the ferment kinetics of our 2019 Riesling. So if you remember, last year what we actually did was we split the juice and we did that flotation technique and one tank we bubbled with oxygen and one that we bubbled with nitrogen. And um, it's interesting to see how this impacted our ferment kinetics. So follow um, the sort of teal or actually the light blue line and the pink line here as we down, uh, have a downward trend in our total soluble solids or bricks. And you can see that the oxygen treatment had a steeper curve and finished earlier than the nitrogen. And I think that partially that is due to having more dissolved oxygen in the juice that made the yeast happy and um, ready to ferment more quickly. And after we ferment, we've got wine. So we need chemical analysis at this stage as well. So the good first step is pH, titratable acidity, volatile acidity, and total sulfur dioxide. Um, so we're looking at acids, basically how much vinegar um, is in there, and the concentration of total SO2, which is a light antimicrobial. The most important thing that we need at this stage is residual sugar, because you may see the values on the hydrometer or the densitometer flatline, but that doesn't mean that actually you've run out of sugar. So if you just think you're dry because the numbers stop changing, but then you undergo malolactic and fermentation or you just store the wine in tank, you are susceptible to re-fermentation um, and other issues uh, like, for example, rogue malolactic bacteria um, producing volatile acidity. So if we were actually to do an MLF, we would want to get a malolactic or excuse me, a malic um, acid value as well. This is less common in aromatic whites um, and more common in some full-bodied styles like Chardonnay. So we'll talk more about that next week. Um, you might have noticed here that we actually don't have free sulfur dioxide on our chemical analysis here. And that's because coming straight out of ferment, you should have close to no free sulfur dioxide because it's basically bound up during the chaos of fermentation. So um, I'll show you some panels in just a second. You'll see that when ETS analyzes our wine, they do report free sulfur dioxide, but it's always undetectable. And 
Many aromatic styles of white wine are fast-tracked towards bottling because oak or oak aging isn't uh, an, an important comp, uh, component of these wines. So what that means is that we're starting the stabilization process pretty early. So we want to add sulfur dioxide and keep these wines away from air, and we're going to get prepped for the stabilization process. So here's a comparison of some aromatic whites straight out of ferment here from College Cellars. So you can see at that top line there, the free sulfur dioxide, uh, we have a negligible value across the board because during ferment, the, free, the sulfur dioxide that we utilize during the crush process has bound right up. And um, we haven't talked about molecular sulfur dioxide much, but basically it's just a function of free sulfur dioxide and pH. And since we have a negligible level, we're also gonna have a negligible level of molecular sulfur dioxide. Interestingly enough here, we actually do have a little bit of variation in our total sulfur dioxide. Um, and part of that is due to um, how we have more or less sulfur, sulfur dioxide utilized during the processing of these fruits. Um, let's take a look here. I'm going to highlight a few numbers. So um, 5.9 grams a liter of TA on the muscat. So we did a little bit of an acid add on this, but it's still relatively low in comparison to these other wines. Like take a look at the Sauve Blanc here. This was uh, requiring no acid to be added because we had a pretty early harvest on this. And you can see that we really have fresh acidity. So um, if you have a takeaway here, it's that Muscat has a, a lower um, titratable acidity than these other aromatic whites. And um, actually, interestingly enough here, check this out, 362. That makes me a little anxious on the Viognier, but the titratable acidity here is nice um, and, I, and high. So I, this tastes right, even if the pH is a little high. Um, and another thing worth noting here, um, you can see that the yeast were a little bit more stressed out on the Viognier um, than they were on the other ferments because the VA is higher and yeast produce that in response to uh, fermentation stress. And um, just over the last 10 years of winemaking, I've seen that it's pretty common for um, Viognier uh, ferments to get a little stressed out. Um, they just might be, um, I think it's just more sugar um, and also I think that they might just have more of something like proteins or something in them that causes yeast to be a little bit stressed. And uh, yeah speaking of stress 14.8 who boy uh, this is a candidate for a little bit of blending here uh, that is a high alcohol Viognier um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Viognier next week when we do more full-bodied whites but uh, this uh, But Viognier really only gets its characteristic flavors when it's really quite ripe. So um, when we're making Viognier here in the Walla Walla Valley, it's a, it can be a little bit of a struggle to get it to be really nice and flavor ripe with a lot of that stone fruit at a moderate level of alcohol. And I am just overjoyed by having a low 13 value on the Sauve Blanc here um, because like just like the Viognier, it can be a bit of a struggle for all of these aromatic whites with the exception of Muscat to really have their full flavor ripeness at a moderate um, level of alcohol. So I'm loving that number. In the winter after harvest, we are going to stabilize these wines. So um, not necessarily in order, we're going to heat stabilize and cold stabilize these wines. So for heat stability, we need to remove the proteins that would um, fall out of, or excuse me, um, change their light refraction um, under heat or cold conditions so that if someone puts this nice aromatic white wine in the fridge, it's not going to throw a haze. So the same principle of these proteins changing conformational shape is the same as if you fry an egg on a pan. Think about how the, uh, the white started out clear and then went opaque white. The same thing's happening in the wine when proteins change conformational shape. So we would perform a bentonite trial and figure out how much bentonite we need to add. Um, this is one of the things in winemaking that actually doesn't have a lot of options. So there are some um, proteases being trialed um, where we were hoping that we can maybe um, basically break down these uh, unstable proteins in the wine. But right now, the only option for true heat stability is bentonite additions. 
and then um, we can also undergo cold stability. So what we're doing here is we're removing potassium and potassium bitartrate so that when the wine gets cold, the potassium bitartrate doesn't fall out of solution and form wine diamonds. So the main method that this is done by is just traditional chilling, where you get your tank really cold um, or you roll your barrels outside if you uh, live in a cooler climate like Walla Walla uh, in the winter. And um, that chilling forces those crystals out of solution so that that same process doesn't happen in somebody's fridge. Um, other facilities may have uh, more enhanced technology, like for example, ion exchange, which swaps out that potassium that was present in the wine so that it can't form potassium bitartrate and uh, we don't get crystal formation. And if you are um, in a pinch for time, we can also use carboxymethylcellulose, which is a cellulose gum. And what this does is it coats all the forming tartrate crystals so that they can't form larger crystals, which are actually visible to the eye. So we use this on our muscat because our turnaround time is so fast that we actually don't have time to do a traditional chilling process. This tool isn't for every wine because um, this can actually interact with color compounds. Um, so it's not um, a great universal tool. And at this stage, we're also going to start pushing for microbiological stability. And that means removing the microorganisms, microorganisms that we don't want to have there. So of course, we're going to be utilizing sulfur dioxide. We added it post fermentation and we're adding it at least quarterly. And then we're going to change that level up to its final level right before bottling. And then we're going to move into a filtration process and basically for any wine that has any residual sugar, though it's just a great process across the board, you should be sterile filtering. So what we need to do is do a sort of a step down process because if we run the raw wine right up against the membrane filter on the bottling truck, it's gonna foul because we've got too much junk in there and those pore sizes are really, really small. So what we do here is we undergo, undergo a cross flow filtration process and I'll talk about that in the next slide. So when we're getting things prepped for bottling, we're going to go through another clarification step, and that's just getting the wine ready to see the filter on the bottling line. So we've got to remove insoluble objects from the wine. So that includes yeast and bacteria and long chain macromolecules. And we can do this through natural sedimentation where heavy stuff falls to the bottom of the tank, or we can do it through a mechanical separation process. So um, wines can be centrifuged which forces light wine um, out through um, basically the top of the centrifuge um, and separates light and heavy. We could do this through a depth filter or a diatomaceous earth filter. Um, we could do it through a fiber material, which basically means that we're doing a torturous path of forcing um, wines through a series of pads in a plate and frame filter. Or if we're at the college here, we cross flow filter things, which is a tangential filtration process. And you're going to be hearing way more about this in the future. So um, for our white wines, um, actually for really all of our wines, we are doing cross flow filtration. And right before cross flow filtering, we're going to be dealing with blending and style. If a blend needs to happen, we want it to happen before that cross flow filtration process. Um, because then the blend is set. If we're adding any sugar, it went in before the cross flow. So we haven't um, basically added new microbes or something bad to our wine um, because we added it in after we had cleaned up the wine with the cross flow. So an overview of styles here. Looking at Sauve Blanc first, uh, does it blend a lot? Uh, yes, with Semillon. Um, We've actually thrown in some Semillon and some of our soft blancs historically just to round out the mouthfeel a little bit. Um, is it common to have residual sugar through a halted fermentation or Seuss reserve? So it's rare to have a sweet profile on a Sauvignon Blanc, but in some high acid regions um, or, and wines made from cool climates like New Zealand, it's common just to have a teeny smidge in to help balance out the acidity. So the wines may not actually have that sweet of a profile, but there is a little bit of sugar in there. 
And um, our Sauvignon Blanc, I think, has about three grams. And do you need to phenolically polish Sauvignon Blanc? Maybe um, if the juice polishing wasn't uh, enough. And uh, since we've got about three grams in our Sauvignon Blanc, that actually serves to polish out any phenolics that might have been rough. Moving into Gewürz, will it blend rare? Um, you see blends of Gewürz in Alsace, but um, in most areas you see uh, pure varietal wines. Is it common to halt the fermentation or have a sous reserve? Yes. And um, do you need to phenolically polish this before bottling? Potentially, if it's a very dry style, but because uh, Gewürz Terminers tend to have a good amount of sugar, that sugar is gonna mask phenolic issues. In Riesling, it's rare to blend it as well and it is common to have residual sugar. Riesling doesn't have a lot of um, bitter phenolics, so it's rare that you would need um, a phenolic polish, especially if there would be residual sugar involved. For muscats, again, it's rare to blend and it's common to have residual sugar. And because of that residual sugar, it's um, rare that you would need a phenolic polish. If you've tasted a dry muscat, they're actually quite phenolic but because um, there aren't very many dry muscats made, it's rare that you would actually need to polish up those phenolics at the end of the process. And finally, Viognier. Does it blend? Yeah, okay, occasionally. Um, is it common to have residual sugar here through a halted fermentation or sous reserve? No. So Viognier can have um, quite a bit of an appearance of sweetness um, because of the ripeness and the high alcohol. However, it is very rare to actually have residual sugar in these wines. Um, actually, another thing to note is that um, the um, lightness of the acidity in the wine can also kind of increase the appearance of a sweetness, even if it's not there. Um, it's like the opposite of having a high acid style. And th you might potentially need to um, do some fining on Viognier for phenolics just because it is a grippy variety. So if um, the juice fining wasn't enough, then you may need to clean it up on the back. And hooray, we're finally at the bottling stage of the wine production process. So we're going to need to get some pre-bottling analysis here. Um, and really it's about confirming the values from before and basically getting final values. And if we need to add something like sulfur dioxide, um, we would know um, the difference between where we are and what we want our final value to be. So um, getting that free and total sulfur value is really important at this stage. And make sure that you mix your tank up really well. Um, you can do this at the boutique level by rolling with nitrogen. Um, uh, this actually can be utilized um, at even the larger level by using pulse air systems with nitrogen. So um, there's also some fun that can be had here. You or your marketing team is going to figure out your glass choice and your color and the weight of the glass and how much it costs. So um, for certain aromatic white styles, to kind of shut your eyes and think about what you imagine. Like Riesling and Gewürztraminer tend to be in hawk-shaped bottles, which are those tall skinnies. And um, you can actually choose um, different colors for your glass. Um, like Riesling, uh, some people might even put it in blue glass, which is kind of fun. And then you also have to choose your closure. So for really fresh styles of aromatic wines, I feel like screw cap is really the best choice um, just because it ensures a level of consistency. And you're gonna hear Tim talk a lot about the merits of cork versus screw cap and other choices. Um, but for our white wines, with the exception of our Chardonnay, um, we do everything under screw cap now just to retain freshness and consistency. And then we're also going to choose how much of a filtration we want on this wine. So when you're bottling, if you do a sterile bottling, there is a membrane filter attached to the bottling apparatus. So if um, we're sterile bottling, um, that membrane, for example, is on that bottling truck that we utilize. If you have a dry wine that has undergone full malolactic fermentation and has a good level of sulfur dioxide, you could go to bottle without sterile filtering. However, um, I highly recommend sterile just because it helps you sleep better at night. But a lot of aromatic styles of wine, so for example, our Muscat, our Riesling, and even our Sauv Blanc with that teeny kiss of residual sugar at just that like at or below perception threshold, 
we need to have sterile um, bottling on these wines. And we also get to choose a little bit about the dissolved gases in our wines. You really want to get your dissolved oxygens as low as possible. And this is a topic for um, EV205, actually. But um, we sparge with nitrogen to get those DO levels as low as possible because that dissolved oxygen, one milligram a liter of dissolved oxygen um, swoops up four milligrams a liter of um, free sulfur dioxide. So if we have dissolved oxygen in our wine, it just eats up that sulfur that we added in preparation for bottling. And also, some aromatic styles of white wine actually benefit from a little bit of dissolved CO2. So um, on one of our Zoom tastings, uh, someone was asking about, what's the spritz in this Riesling? And we had actually uh, poured the Lawson Blue Slate um, Riesling, and even after it had been poured into a little two ounce tube, it still had a little bit of spritz to it. And that really served to liven up the palate. And um, that level of dissolved gas can be common in certain aromatic styles just to pop the freshness. So um, you may actually want to choose to retain a little bit of dissolved CO2 in your wines just to, to keep things fresh. Now is a good time to pour yourself a glass of the 2019 Sauvignon Blanc. And we're going to review what we did and why going through it basically day by day. So you harvested this fruit on September 10th of 2019 after we had assessed that um, it may not improve upon the vine. We had been dealing with a little bit of rain. It was a cooler and wetter harvest um, than previous years. So our soft long skins were softening up in the vineyard and we had some concerns about fruit integrity. So on September 10th, we harvested that and I sprinkled the bins with a little bit of KMBS because we were actually going to process it the next day because we didn't have time to process it on the same day. So that KMBS served as a little antimicro um, antimicrobial antioxidant. And then on September 11th, you can see we have multiple entries here because this is the true flurry of activity. So we distemmed and crushed this under carbon dioxide snow and the distem and crush serves for us to get a little bit of skin extraction and um, in the skins, we have a lot of aromatic compounds that we want to extract. And that CO2 snow is there for freshness um, so that we don't oxidize the juice. And then right after that, we, we sent this into the press through an axial feed valve. So basically you're just stemming um, right into a hopper and that hopper is pushing that must right into the press. So we were throwing in some rice hulls at that hopper so that we could have some juice channeling. And then we did a reductive membrane press on this um, so that we were retaining the freshness of the juice. Right after that, Tim went into the clarification via flotation process. And the float package on this include Lysis Ultra, which is um, an, a pectinase enzyme. It included PVPP, which helps to pull out some of our phenolics that we would have got from our skin contact, and a little bit of light bentonite and also philia EPL gelatin. So that gelatin forms the cap that we're sticking everything to during the flotation process. And this results in a rapid clarification and some of the removal of phenolics that we got from the skin contact. And then right after that was done, we're moving things to the clean tank. So we're racking out underneath that cap. We pull the juice from the tank and it goes to a clean tank and one neutral barrel. We like to do a neutral barrel on our Sauv Blancs now, just because it adds a little bit of additional texture. And then the next day, um, we inoculated this with QA23 yeast, which is our preferred yeast for most aromatic whites. And we let this tick down. Um, we're fermenting it around you know, 13 to 14 degrees Celsius. And um, we did many DAP additions because we wanted freshness and this wine has a tendency to get a little stinky. So we did four different DAP additions. And then um, when the tank went dry, which is October 15th, we um, added KMBS and the barrel went through a lot more slowly. So we added KMBS on December 12th and that's for antimicrobial and antioxidant protection. And then during the winter time, we did tank chilling on this for cold stabilization. And we rolled that um, Sauv Blanc barrel outside as well with the rest of the barrels for cold stabilization. And on February 24th and 28th, um, our team members added bentonite. 
So um, we poured that into the barrel and also into the tank, and that was for heat stabilization. And then um, on the week of March 19th through 13th, we wrapped this out, blended in a teeny bit of juice just for that three gram a liter and sent it through the cross flow. So we rounded out our mouthfeel a little bit and we are also minimizing the microbial issues. So we're getting the wine ready so that it, when it hits that sterile membrane on the bottling truck, it doesn't foul the membrane. And on March 18th, this went to bottle and we did do that sterile bottling because that three grams of sugar means that we've got to have a sterile bottle. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. Whew, I have been talking for an hour and 10 minutes and I deserve this glass of Riesling. So uh, pour yourself some of our 2019 and uh, taste along with us here. So another big list of ac um, action here. So on September 20th, this was harvested. And honestly, on the Y column, Lacey told us to come get our fruit. Um, we've been getting Sagemore fruit for several years and the Bacchus vineyard is within the Sagemore properties. So Bacchus is on the label, but um, it's one of the Sagemore wines. So when you take a look at our ETS reports and you see SMRI, that is why. And Lacey knows our style. So um, she told us when to get our fruit. And on that same day, we distemmed and crushed and half of it was under CO2 snow. So we're getting a little bit of light skin extraction. Um, and also when we are distemming like this, it's helping us get a little bit more yield out of the press. Uh, right after that, we membrane pressed with KMBS and Sinfree. So we're having a little bit of light antioxidant activity here and that Sinfree is gonna be a settling aid. And then right after we did clarification via flotation and we had some fun here because we floated one under nitrogen and one under oxygen. And the float package for both of these included gel called Supra and PVPP. So this is gelatin and PVPP. And what we were doing here was having a rapid clarification of the juice and the PVPP was helping remove some of the phenolics gained from the skin contact in the press. And then right after that, when we had clarified juice, we did our Seuss Reserve prep. So we pulled um, wine to our excuse me, juice to one stainless steel barrel that had been sanitized via steam. We put 10 grams, uh, or excuse me, 100 grams of KMBS and 100 grams of potassium sorbate into there and filled it up with juice. And uh, we hold this Seuss Reserve to add sweetness to the final Riesling blend, but we also sprinkle it in other places as well. And then the juice that was now in the clean tank um, that's uh, not the Seuss Reserve juice, the stuff that we're going to ferment, is inoculated with VIN-13. And we like this yeast for Riesling because it's cold tolerant all the way down to 10 degrees Celsius, which is actually really difficult to ferment at. So it gives us some flexibility in terms of what temperature we're gonna ferment. And for Riesling, we really like long, slow, and cold. And then additionally, VIN 13 is known for promoting floral aromas in Riesling. On September 29th and October 10th, we added DAP just because the ferment was getting a little stinky. And when it went dry on November 13th, we did a KMBS addition for antimicrobial and antioxidant activity. And just like the Sauv Blanc during the winter, um, this, uh, the, some of the, actually these were in stainless steel barrels, excuse me, I was saying tank, but we actually fermented these in individual stainless steel barrels. So these barrels were moved outside for cold stabilization. And on March 5th, uh, we did a bentonite addition to both of those barrels, the nitrogen and the oxygen treatment uh, for heat stabilization. And in that same week that the Sauv Blanc was cross-flowed, this was also cross-flowed. And right before that cross-flow, we blended back in that juice to get 17 grams a liter of residual sugar in the final wine. And then on March 18th, just like the Sauv Blanc, it went to bottle under sterile bottling because we have some residual sugar there. Thank you everyone for letting me yammer at you for an hour and 14 minutes. Uh, send help. I'm trapped under Digby. <laughs> if you've got any questions, I am here to answer uh, via email. Cheers.